this somewhat solipsistic view of myself is um, hopefully going to be explained. Um, when I think of all the, um, well, I have such a keen interest in multidisciplinary approaches to almost everything. All I have to do is remember that at one time uh, I was a guitarist and I thought I'd be a guitarist for the rest of my life. Um, unchecked arthritis is like a slow motion car crash and uh, slowly robs you of things you once took for granted, things that were packaged and you never really had to look into them or change them or go in and hack them. But uh, 10 years into my life as an artist, it became obvious that I would not be able to play for much longer. And as painful, painful as it was to leave my instrument, I continued to study uh, art history and took up piano, playing it unconventionally, but nonetheless. Uh, but this wasn't enough for my faculty advisor who uh, advised me to look for a more fitting major. So I decided to study wildlife biology. Um, there I learned a lot of great things about the natural world and became especially interested in evolutionary ecology and its systems. I was fascinated how the core requirements for a bachelor's degree in biology interrelated. For example, how I was using uh, formulas from information theory that modeled noise in a transmission channel to predict species variability in a habitat, how the same concepts that were used to describe the economy of nature were used to model markets and economics, how coral reefs were like markets with, pul with pulsing cycles of production and consumption, producers and consumers whose daily and evolutionary strategies were shaped by the environment, and how events at the cosmological scale came to affect even the smallest community of organisms. In the end, what I really wanted to do in biology turned out to be just as impossible for me as playing the guitar. There was no way I'd survive in the wilds of the Amazon. Uh, so I left uh, my formal study of biology with a new understanding of evolutionary processes and an exciting taste for the then newly minted analogy between organic and cultural evolution uh, called mimetics. So adapt or perish became my motto, uh, but this was a familiar strategy. In my life, um, I was very influenced by my childhood. Um, my father was nearly blind and helped raise six children and put them through college. Uh, his job as a diplomat took us to many countries and the point was always made never to live in expat enclaves. I was taught to drink deeply from all our host cultures. I internalized a love for cultural diversity and grew to understand cultural relativity to an intuitive level. Every few years, we were challenged to learn new things and relearn some things that we had previously taken for settled knowledge. We were rewarded with new insights on the community, on the commonality between human societies, even while they appeared so different on their surfaces. I returned to music via the newly available personal computer. I embarked on learning this new topic with some weariness, but determined in my knowledge that this would be the answer to my body's decreasing capacity to help me attain any kind of virtuosity with conventional musical instruments. I came to understand how much of what I had previously learned also applied to this new field. A scientist named Dijkstra once uh, famously quoted that uh, the computer, that computer science is as much about computers as astronomy is about telescopes. Within these boxes of, to me, inscrutable components, I could envision creating entire universes of possibility universes that mirrored my increasingly interconnected worldview, universes that would become as an ecosystem is to a biosphere, as a neuron is to a brain that could become almost anything. With the slimmest of actual research into this topic, I'm convinced that our life with its mainstreams, tributaries, dead ends, and engineering projects shares a great deal with how our brains develop and adapt. In the late 40s, a neuroscientist named Hib best illustrated how our brains turn habitual behaviors, so-called associative learning, into bureaucracies of neural tissue called engrams. With enough practice, we turn parts of our neuroanatomy into component-like circuits. We don't need to look at them anymore. They just fire off with barely a thought. And when we lose a physical ability, we can relearn with great plasticity. We deal with change and adversity by adapting and learning. The romantic notion of the artist laboring in solitude, an island of genius waiting discovery, never sounded right to me. Too much of my creativity fed on other ideas. 
I also observed how periodically great weather-like patterns of notion enveloped the scientific and the art communities, self-organizing until there was sometimes, until there sometimes emerged a disruptive consensus notion. I decided I needed to surround myself with artists and technologists, a pool of cross-pollinators from which new aesthetic forms could evolve. I volunteered with curated arts programming and eventually joined the board of DC's preeminent alternative art spaces. I did what I could to build community and present work to new audiences. My life as an artist, my public life as an artist, began with collaboration. I was interested in the intersection of different artistic disciplines and aesthetic positions. After a few years, I joined a, co a collective. Art Attack International was a core group of four artists, and we created temporary site-specific installations, always in C2, mostly in public space, always as a result of intensive brainstorming, promiscuous and completely unqualified interdisciplinary meddling, and uh, always uh, with a vigorous intra-group defense of ideas. Um, we always presented the work also under a factory name. Um, the individuals sort of took a little byline. Um, it was a utopian approach to art. It was art by committee, but with deliberative techniques rigorously developed into procedural components at the service of the work. So after a while, it was just habit, the way we collaborated. And again, these were these sort of packaged little black boxes of procedure that we used uh, and we got better at as we get, went along. Though tacitly political, we never wore it on our sleeves, nor articulated it unless we were forced to. We operated outside the gallery system and sometimes outside the law. When you work in public, you sometimes do that. Um, a good deal of time later, I became my solo. I began my solo practice. And um, although continuing to reinforce my connection to the communities and networks I had become part of, I turned my attention to my own concerns. I helped found and currently run the DC branch of Dorkbot, a special interest group of artist technologists. I also helped spawn and have an ongoing relationship with DC's first hacker space, Hack DC. It took me a while to get technologies, technologists into the mix, but now I see, thanks in part to a growing pile of obsolete technology and a descending price point for many high-tech tools, that a great crucible has formed for interdisciplinary communities who have reinvented the collage remix culture presaged by 20th century artists and the syntheses manifest in the sciences over the past 120 years. To repurpose, reuse, mutate material culture at the grassroots level, creating a massive economy and new forms of aesthetic expression in the process. I'm gonna leave you with two images of a, two pieces of recent pieces of mine. One is a piece called Remembrancer, which worked over four weeks to create three panels using keyword data collected from online sources, each with a different frame of reference. The red panel looked at local and regional keywords. The blue panel looked at national keywords. And the green panel at global keywords. Over time, the sum of those keywords mentioned with the greatest frequency caused more paint to deposit at a given point. This piece is called Still. And it was shown on November of December of last year at the American University Museum's Cats and Arts Center as part of Washington Project for the Arts 35th anniversary exhibition. My long association with the venerable WPA prompted me to create a piece about connection and how I believe it affects artists' successful pursuit of their passion. Over five weeks, this piece used my daily movements around the region as recorded on my phone's GPS logger to map my distance from it by squirting water onto a pile of powdered plaster. The further I was from it, the longer the squirt. 
Both these pieces address the difficulty inherent in recording experience, the stuff that remains mysterious to us as we communicate these things. And while leveraging interconnectedness, they both create documents that are unreadable to any level of certainty. So I work in an interdisciplinary manner uh, because everything is connected. Thank you very much. <laughs>